back, everybody, now to part of our week-long coverage of a stronger America, the Black Agenda. A new analysis of the U.S. prison population finds more black men are incarcerated now than were enslaved in 1850. The figures are stunning. They are sobering, eye-opening numbers. The latest estimates by the Bureau of Justice putting the number of imprisoned African-American men at more than 846,000. While black men account for roughly 6.5% of the U.S. population, they make up 40.2 percent of the prison population. And joining me now is Mark Lamont Hill, professor of education and African American studies at Columbia University and host of Our World with Black Enterprise. So Mark, it's good to have you here. Uh, when we talk about this, uh, it's a problem not discussed enough. Uh, however, when we talk about these sobering statistics that are out now, it really is eye-opening and I think uh, staggering for people to consider. So why is it that this country is putting away so many African American men? Do we have a definite reason for it? Well, we that's committed to punishment rather than dealing with the fundamental problems that lead to mass incarceration. Uh, in 1970, for example, we had, we had about 250 to 300,000 people incarcerated. Now, in 2011, we have 2.5 million people. We didn't raise a generation of criminals. We, we, ch we shifted public policy in such a way that it's easier to get incarcerated. The net is wider and it's deeper. Uh, we live in a nation. Well, wasn't that done out of noble causes to begin with? I mean, with the population growth and the fact that crimes in, in this day and age are expanding to different fronts that people probably hadn't even considered then, including technology crimes, uh, does it make a difference in how we interpret these numbers? Well, most people aren't in jail for the things like technology crimes or mm -hmm. other white collar crimes. Most people are in jail. The prison boom comes, in fact, from the war on drugs, which begins in the mid 80s, 1984, mm -hmm. when drug use was actually at a low. Before crack actually hits the streets, we begin a war on drugs, which really turns out to be a war on small-time drug users. Four out of five people who are incarcerated for drugs are not dealers, they're small-time users. And right. again, that's a criminalization of a medical problem. We've decided to use punishment instead of uh, social resources. Uh, so the new NAACP report ties state spending uh, to investments in education. So nationwide, $88,000 is spent on each incarcerated juvenile a year, while just 9000 is spent educating each student. So can we approach this problem, and I know you just mentioned this about education, I mean, is that the answer to this over-incarceration issue is the education of the youth of America? Uh, it's, it's a solution. It's not the only solution. There's no silver bullet to the mass incarceration crisis. But certainly, we live in a nation that's committed to first-class jails and second-class schools. If we decide that we can put that money in education, yes, we would reduce the prison population. The fact is, there's a relationship between literacy rates and prison. There's a relationship between dropout rates, early childhood education, early literacy, mentoring, sports participation. Mm -hmm. All these things connect to prison. So if we understand that we can invest early, we pay now or we pay later. It's really as simple. Uh, let's also take a look at parenting because the stats here are pretty eye-opening as well because one in 15 black children have a parent that is in prison compared to one in 111 white kids. Uh, so are we just watching and witnessing as generations continue to grow up a vicious cycle that's becoming ingrained within the black community itself? Well, um, you know, we have to be careful with the way we talk about that. There is a cycle of mass incarceration within poor communities and African-American communities, mm -hmm. but we want to be careful not to suggest that mass incarceration is due to some kind of culture of poverty, as if poor people or black people are more inclined to go to prison. The fact is, black people are targeted for prison more. If I went to Harvard University or Princeton University on a Friday night, I can incarcerate a lot of people or arrest a lot of people for, you know, simple possession of drugs, for public drunkenness, for public urination, for disorderly conduct. But we're not looking at Harvard and Princeton, but we go to poor neighborhoods like in New York where three county or where three counties produce 70 percent of the state's prisoners. Those are poor black and brown people. That's the fundamental issue. At the same time, we do need to consider how mass incarceration takes fathers out of homes. It takes people out of out of active citizenship. It really deteriorates the community. And that's what we need to think about. This right here basically is the final step in the school to prison pipeline. The, the, the what pipeline? School to prison pipeline. This is an easy way out. I think that they slap a suspension on the table, send them home for a couple of days. In color. 
You can't wear a hat there. You can't wear a coat there. You might get suspended for wearing a hat after, you know, five or six times if a, prin a principal tells you to take it off, you still have on, you might be suspended for just a hat. Uh, you're very quickly graduating into uh, arrests, graduating into uh, placements in either treatment centers, up growing up into the adult prison system. They don't understand how close they are. Like, once you get suspended, you're almost a foot in the door. It's closer than what you think. Like, adulthood is closer than what you think. Responsibility is closer than what you think. This pipeline is closer than what you think. Around the U.S., millions are celebrating the life and the birthday of civil rights icon Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This parade marched through a mile of one of D.C.'s lower income areas. But despite the celebrations, the reality for many black Americans is sobering. They experience higher unemployment rates than whites and Latinos. Experts say as high as 23% in comparison to the nation's nearly 9%. In order for us to be equal, we need to not be afraid of change. Okay, we have to get out here and get that education. Wanda Sims is a high school dropout and used to run a daycare center. She says she now lives at the poverty level. All the time we don't have connections that will hook us up with places to get into jobs, you know what I mean? Nationwide, news isn't any better for all ethnic groups. Economists are reporting a jump in unemployment benefits, which usually happens after the end of the year shopping season. The U.S. Labor Department said people who filed weekly applications climbed 24,000 to a seasonally rated amount of about 400,000. It's the highest level in six weeks. As Americans commemorate the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and they celebrate his legacy, they look at how far they have come as a country and how far they still have to go.
Blacks, whites, Asians, and Latinos, and many other ethnic groups look at the issues that the country is still struggling with, including housing, education, and jobs. Experts say there are higher expectations for the Obama administration, but that he's fallen short on delivering, mostly because of a divided Congress. There was a tremendous amount of willingness on the part of the black community to suspend disbelief and to feel that things are, with the election of President Obama, things have really changed. I'm not so sure that many of them still believe that. For some, Dr. King's legacy is a reminder for many that the prologue to change is struggle, even as protests continue in the U.S. and the call for lawmakers to be accountable grows louder. The bad part comes um, with, you know, obviously there's a economy, you know, the economy is a bad economic crisis going on right now uh, that we all have to, you know, go through together. For Americans who suffer from a paucity of jobs, the challenge for change continues. Colin Campbell, Press TV, Washington. Because you can't. Why, it's always open season. enough to her to burn her severely. Ayana's body was burned severely and the family has asked me to have an autopsy conducted by Dr. Mark Spitz, Macomb County Medical Examiner, and that is taking place, I believe, today. Virtually simultaneously with a bomb being thrown through the window onto Ayana, a shot is fired from outside on the porch into the home. The shot is unquestionably fired outside the home while the officer is standing on the porch. We know there's only one shot it vividly de depicted in the videotape. It is virtually simultaneously, but right after the, th the explosion of the bomb. And at that point, the officers rush into the home. You don't have to batter down that door because that door wasn't locked. So an examination of that door showed that the locks were intact, the casing was intact, the door frame was intact. Somebody simply opened the outside metal door, which was a metal screen, and kicked at the door and it immediately opened. Ayana was lying there lifeless. They grab her body virtually immediately and carry her out um, in a heart-rending fashion like a rag doll. And, and the videotape displays her being carried out virtually immediately upon the officers entering the home. For 15, five to 15 officers who know what happened, I'm asking, that some of them have the ounce of the milk of human kindness to go forward to Chief Evans, go forward to your assistant chief, go forward to your eternal affairs and admit and tell them the truth about what happened.
Breaking news at 11 o'clock. An NYP detective involved in the deadly shooting of Sean Bell in Queens is being fired. Two other detectives will resign. Good evening. I'm David Navarro. Bill is off. And I'm Shade Federer-Noir. The Sean Bell case gained national attention. The groom-to-be was killed the night before his wedding in a hail of NYPD bullets. Eyewitness News reporter Matt Kozar is in lower Manhattan with our lead story. Matt. David, we learned Police Commissioner Ray Kelly is upholding a judge's decision to fire Detective Gaspard Isnora, but allow another officer involved in the Sean Bell shooting to continue working. NYPD spokesman Paul Brown issued this statement saying, quote, there is nothing in the record to warrant overturning the decision of the department's trial judge. Uh, as Isnora was one of five officers who shot and killed 23-year-old Sean Bell five years ago on his wedding day. The case led to criticism of how NYPD undercover officers operate, and it sparked national outrage. Isnora was acquitted of wrongdoing in state Supreme Court, but a police department administrative trial found he fired his weapon outside of departmental guidelines, and a judge ruled Isnora should be fired for his actions. Two other detectives involved in the shooting will also be leaving the department, Michael Oliver and Mark Cooper. They, however, reached a deal to retire, and they're giving up some pay, but they're keeping the attention. Uh, they're expected to do so on Monday. Thank you. Well, this morning we are learning much more about the identity of a Bart police officer who shot and killed a man, a Hayward man, on New Year's Day. Now, we have to warn you, be aware, the video we're about to show you is graphic. Some viewers may choose not to watch it. KTVU's Claudine Wong is joining us live. She's in our newsroom with the very latest information. Good morning, Claudine. Good morning, Dave. Yes, this new video comes from the family attorney, John Burris. The person who took it wants to remain anonymous. Now, it shows the shooting from another angle. It also shows more of what led up to the shooting and reactions afterwards. It is graphic, so we want to warn you again that you may not want to watch. Even early on, passengers seemed to be bothered by what was going on. We know that several people recorded various parts of the shooting. This person stood on the train just feet away. The video shows three men sitting on the platform against the wall. 22-year-old Oscar Grant is in the middle. The two officers seem to be concerned with Grant and the person to the right. The third man sits for the most part alone with his hands up. At one point, Grant gets up and they push him back down. There seems to be some kind of struggle, although you can't hear what's being said between Grant and the officers. About a minute into the video, another officer steps in and pushes Grant back to the ground. About 15 seconds later, one officer puts his knee on Grant's head, and the other officer seems to do a pat down. Then he pulls his gun, and a second later fires what would be a fatal shot. But watch his reaction. He stares, then looks up, looks down, then puts his hands to his head, while the other officer stares at him. In fact, it takes them another seven or eight seconds to start reacting and checking Grant, all while the people on the train seem shocked by what they just witnessed. It's going on. Bart's board president is asking for calm. My, uh, my own feeling is that uh, we still need to be patient and not let our emotions get us carried away and uh, try to get ahead of the curve. Let's, let's, get the, let's get the puzzle put together and then we'll... We'll come to a conclusion.
right here um, at the Trayvon Riley of Marissa Stone. And we're going to be asking, we're going to be doing a little slight interview about the situation. Um, nice to meet you, Marissa. Nice to meet you as well. Um, so what are your thoughts right now in, in terms of what's happening with the Trayvon situation? Well, my thoughts are we are in 2012 and we are still experiencing some of the things that our forefathers and our elders and ancestors have fought for for many years. You know, our freedom, you know, as people of color. And unfortunately, this crime was perpetrated uh, by a person of color. And, um, you know, I really think that it is great, as you can see, that, you know, not only here in Baltimore City that people have come together, but around the nation. People have come together to address the issues of social, racial, and um, economic justice. Thank you. Do you think it would have been any different had Trayvon been white? No. Yes, I do. I think it would have been different. I don't think that uh, we would be here today. I think the person would have been arrested as a person of color. He would have been arrested for um, killing um, a white man. What about the situation now? Have you have you um, been familiar with the news, what's going on, how they trying to go into Trayvon's past? Right. I think that, you know, that's bogus. I think that it's, it's inappropriate. But it's, you know, typical. Um, in our country, we always try to, you know, blame the victim. We always try to profile the victim, you know, as, you know, being something being wrong with that individual. So whether that individual was suspended, it had nothing to do with that young man walking home and being slain in cold blood. The mayor, um, I think his name is Nutter, up in Philly, he, he made an interesting comment. He said that Trayvon was assassinated. Yes, he was. So you believe that too? Yes, he was. In cold blood. Cold blood. What about Sean Bell, the one that got shot 50 times, um, Amadi Diallo, Oscar Grant? These were victims of uh, police brutality. Do you think anything is uh, related to you know this situation with Trayvon, how the police is dealing with this? Well, I think that we operate in two different um, social justice systems in this country. We um, operate in two uh, social welfare systems in this country. We operate in two economic systems in this country. So you will see that, you know, across the board that we are still victims, you know, of, of racial injustice, economic injustice, and social injustice. Okay. Well, thank you for your input, Marissa. All right. I'm the studio director of the Living Well Studio. We're located at 2443 North Charles Street. We're devoted to soulful expression, conscious expansion, and optimal wellness. So we're here today representing the Living Well Studio where, at the end of the day, our goal is to build community. Okay. Thank you very much. Have you heard anything about the situation, what's going on with Trayvon's, uh, they trying to dig up his uh, reputation, they trying to say some bad things about him. About Have you heard about that? Yeah. I heard it's 
I just heard on the news that they're trying to dig up a pass as far as why he was suspended. Have you heard about that? I haven't heard about that. Yeah, they just, the radio and the news are actually trying to make something of it. Trying to say that he was over his mother's house, I mean over his father's house, because he was suspended from school for some incident he had with some uh, marijuana or something like that. But you know how they always try to bastardize, you know, when they commit a wrong and they don't want to admit to it, they try to bastardize. So they're trying to make something, make him look bad. Yeah. At the end of the day, I know that's what people do, trying to make someone look bad. Um, but at the end of the day, you can have any weapons on him. You know, he wasn't the one going after seven years. You know, he's just going on about his daily life, walking around his own neighborhood, you know, and um, them and approached him, you know, for whatever reason. You know, if you hear the video, the video tape or the recordings, you know, one of the police officers said, that's the guy who's opposite. Then he said, well, he looks black. In my opinion, that is not an answer. Saying that a person is black or whatever doesn't make somebody suspect. Right. That, I think it's a pretty good What do you think as far as the um, connection between Sean Bell, uh, Oscar Grant, um, Amadi Diallo, these are all victims of uh, brutal police brutality. Sean Bell was shot like 50 times unarmed. Amadi Diallo was shot 41 times unarmed. Oscar Grant, he was shot um, in Oakland. He was handcuffed. He was um, put on the floor. He was basically subdu um, subdued. And a, and a cop still shot him. Do you think anything is related in terms of how the police department in Florida is handling his case? Do you think that there's any bias and any racism involved in that? I think it's racism. I think they're trying to cover it up. Um, they're all related. You know, all of them are African American. And um, I think it's just another way to bring down the black people, to bring down the black community and the men. You know, and I just think that Thank you for your um, in insight, information, very informative. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, peace and blessings. Um, my name is Jason Harris. I'm down here today with uh, my wife and my son. Um, primarily for my son because it's important that he has an idea of um, who he is, who his people are. Are you, are you surprised that it's happening in the year 2012 with a so-called black president that we have? No, I mean, there's, in fact, in Georgia, there was another young brother that was killed by um, two security guards over the weekend. Urban Johnson. Oh, it just happened? It just happened down in Georgia, um, the Cap So, you know, we could, like, you could go online and there's lists and
look at it. And, right, exactly. Yeah. So all of this, do you think it's all connected? Uh, it's it's connected in the sense that, you know, um, it's truly to understand the nature of racism. We understand that this is a, a social disease. As long as it's treated as, or not treated, or just considered, um, you know, not an issue, then it's going to continue to happen. My name is Kadir, I'm Marty, and I'm here with a long perspective on a lot of things that, are, that is affecting the community in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, Omar um, Boxing Gym is a uh, long contributing um, resource for this community in Baltimore. It provides a outlet and a alternative for a lot of the kids from youth up until uh, all throughout the teenage. Um, he's very dedicated, devoted to trying to uplift and empower the, the community here in Baltimore, Maryland. And, uh, I'm just here to share a lot of insight and awareness that the brother Marvin, who is the founder of this um, marvelous uh, gym. Um, I'm here, as you know, to give a, to give the community a understanding of what do you have to offer in terms of the program. Umar's boxing. Can you tell me a little bit about it? The Umar boxing program is one of the first boxing programs with legitimate education components where the boxing and books go on at the same time on the one group. A lot of people don't associate boxing with thinking, but the good boxing is a good thing. It's like playing chess. You know, the camera and make the first move. You know, it takes a thinking person to do that. So what we're trying to do here at the mall is embrace the stereotype that we do have in the box. And have them see kids in a different light, using their minds along with their hands. So in terms of the the, the boxing itself, um, when you say stereotype, is it because when people think about Baltimore City, right? And they think about, okay, Baltimore City is one of the most wrongest neighborhoods. A lot of violence and stuff is going on in Baltimore City. Is that really happening? Well, in some cases, uh, uh, in the areas where there's a lot of Stuff was going on when I was young. 
Something like that is happening. You know it's going to affect the kids. Right. What's your views on um, television? Do you think the media has anything to do with how we do ourselves? Yeah, the media has a lot to do with it. Because uh, a lot of us are not really thinking deeply. We try to break things down and realize how false or how true things are. We just take a lot of stuff at face value. Ways of living, ways of power. Are we all my life? 